Okay, uh, hello everyone. Thanks for uh, attending uh, this uh, talk about uh, highly available uh, wide area networks on OpenBSD. Uh, I will start with a few words about me. My name is uh, Marko Cupac. I live in Belgrade, Serbia. I work as a lead system administrator at Kapastar uh, LTD. You can uh, read more about the company I work at uh, at the following uh, link. I'm uh, taking care of uh, around 30 node uh, wide area network, which is uh, completely based on uh, OpenBSD routers. I also care about uh, Juniper switches, which are uh, on uh, LANs of uh, these, uh, these sites. And additionally, I'm, uh, we are also in Kapastar self-hosting all essential internet services uh, by means of free BSD jails like uh, DNS, web database, email, uh, uh, LDAP, uh, instant messaging, and so on. Uh, here are some uh, general guidelines about highly available ones. Uh, as I said, uh, uh, this network is uh, tested in uh, my company. I implemented it uh, there some uh, three years ago, uh, and I am presenting it to you now. So uh, we need uh, hosts on all current 30 plus sites to communicate. This solution has to be secure and confidential. Uh, no data sniffing by third parties while in transit. And also we don't want to have uh, any unwanted traffic. Uh, this solution has to be scalable. We need to be able to add uh, more sites, reasonably easy. Uh, we should be able to change ESPs as we please. Uh, this solution has to be manageable. We don't want to be doing constant reconfiguration, troubleshooting, and uh, like caring too much about uh, uh, about maintenance of this uh, and management of this network. And also solution has to work without interruptions. So we don't want to be constantly answering our users when will internet uh, be back again. Uh, telling ESPs uh, site X is down, we have no idea if it's up uh, to us or you, can you please check? Uh, hearing from ESPs usually lie, I don't know how are <laughs> other ESPs, but uh, here uh, they mostly say, yeah, yeah we checked, uh, everything is fine uh, on our side, and then have technician drive to the site to see. If our router is down, it's usually not. It's usually that uh, our router is up and uh, ESP's router is down. Uh, we don't want to be postponing OS upgrades on routers or doing it uh, at uh, some uh, non-peak hours. And also we don't want to worry what would happen if ESP doesn't fix important link in a short or a longer time, like uh, X minutes, hours, days. So uh, on my network, I opted for a hub and spoke topology. And uh, I implemented the uh, CARP uh, and PFSync uh, at hub site. As you see, we have four GRE tunnels for each spoke. They are protected by transport mode IPsec, and the keying mechanism is ISA KMPD. I know IKED is newer, and there are also even more newer things like, uh, never mind. But okay, this is proven, it works. And uh, it's mature technology, so for me, ISA KMPD is just fine. So uh, we have uh, two tunnels per ESP. One goes to CARP master and uh, one to CARP backup. As we said, four in total. Uh, we are uh, routing uh, by means of OSPF over GRE tunnels. Uh, Hub redistributes default route, 
uh, GRE interfaces on hub depend on CARP, so active routes uh, go through CARP master. And if uh, CARP status change, we have seamless failover to, to another CARP member. Uh, seamless means that uh, no sessions should be interrupted, uh, all downloads should uh, continue, all uh, uh, video, audio streams, whatever. And also spokes fail over between their ESPs, you see primary link over, over blue ESP and then uh, green links over green ESP, which means uh, that when uh, primary ESP goes down, secondary seamlessly take over. Uh, I was also considering the possibility to load balance between ESPs from spokes, but so far I don't have uh, two uh, links of good quality on, uh, on the spoke side. So for now it is a uh, failover. Maybe it will be uh, load balancing somewhere in the future. Okay, so this is standard operation. Uh, we have uh, designated the uh, CARP master, which uh, acts as a hub or center of the star, and spokes communicate over primary ESP. Here we see what happens if designated CARP master goes down, be it crash or maintenance. So designated CARP backup becomes master, uh, spokes seamlessly fail over to new CARP master. All stateful sessions survive and spokes still communicate over primary ESP. Now, if uh, we see what happens about failover on the, on the spoke side, so uh, let's say you see here on the on the third spoke uh, blue link uh, for some reason went down and the uh, traffic fails over seamlessly to backup ESP and also all stateful sessions survive. I only here depicted five of the spokes. Actually, there's uh, around 30 of them at this moment and the number is still growing. So it all looks uh, really nice in uh, logical topology, but let's not forget that uh, these two hub uh, routers are also accessible over some ESP. And we don't want them to be accessible over just one ESP. So uh, from now on, uh, I will not call those two routers. Uh, it, those are those two in the, in the upper corner of the slide. I will call them not routers. Uh, I call them NAT routers because uh, they NAT for headquarters LAN. And we need to introduce another CARP pair. That's the, the pair of routers in the, in the center of the, of the slide. And we will call these BGP routers. Because they talk BGP to two upstream ESPs. Each BGP router is connected to both ESPs over slash 29 network. We need, uh, that's a total six addresses. We need one address for physical address of one BGP router, the other for physical address of the second BGP router, third for CARP address, and uh, fourth, of course, for uh, ESP routers. For this setup, we uh, got our own autonomous system and slash 24 public IPv4 network. We announce this uh, autonomous system and public IPv4 network to upstream ISPs over BGP. And uh, this is the mo one of the most important parts of this setup is that we instruct BGP peers to send us traffic over CARP interface instead uh, of a physical interface, which allows us to seamlessly fail over. So we see here if uh, one of our uh, BGP routers uh, goes down. Let's say the designated BGP card master uh, routes between DMZ and internet. 
Uh, it's interesting that uh, these BGP routers have no default route. Best route to each internet prefix is determined by BGP. And uh, some traffic goes through ESP1, other through ESP2. Here we see a BGP CARP failover, so designated BGP CARP master goes down, be it crash or maintenance, designated BGP CARP backup becomes master. Uh, both ESPs seamlessly continue sending traffic to new CARP master and all stateful sessions survive, which means no interrupted downloads, no interrupted uh, uh, video, audio conferences, icecast streams, whatever. It should be completely uh, unnoticed from any uh, users on uh, on our network. Uh, not only can we survive uh, the uh, crash or uh, reboot of uh, one of our uh, BGP routers, we also can survive uh, the loss of any of the two ESPs uh, in our headquarters. So, as you see, ESP1 went down, no problem, because uh, ESP2 is still up, so DMZ is still accessible from the Internet, and the Internet is accessible from DMZ, and also our uh, headquarters LAN can access uh, DMZ and Internet by means of NAT. Uh, I see you are asking some questions. Thank you. Uh, well, I will answer them uh, after I uh, finish presentation. So uh, having our own uh, public IP space and uh, routing BGP uh, has uh, a lot of benefits, not only the possibility to have this uh, nice, uh, highly available uh, network setup, uh, here are some of, uh, of the benefits. So DMZ stays reachable even if one of the two ESPs go down. Uh, we have our public uh, slash 24 pool of IP addresses uh, and it is our own piece of the internet. Uh, we can change ESPs as we like without changing our public IP addresses as long as they give us uh, slash uh, 29s and talk BGP to us. Uh, for people not uh, really familiar with uh, BGP and uh, uh, and autonomous systems, uh, you can think of it as uh, obtaining your own domain name. So if I have my uh, domain mimar.rs, uh, I can uh, move it to whatever providers I want just by uh, changing DNS records. So it's like this. We have our own public slash 24. We can announce it to upstream uh, BGP uh, providers from wherever we want, as long as they give us slash 29s and talk BGP to us. We can offer, from network point of view, highly available public internet services from our DMZ on our own IP address space. Uh, that's first and foremost DNS servers because a reverse zone is required uh, for BGP, but also web uh, database, IM, mail, VPN, whatever. So highly available services on our own IP address space, which means they should be always on. And at some point, some ESP uh, can't say just uh, I'm changing IP addresses, so reconfigure all your infrastructure or whatever. Okay, that was a theoretical concept, and now we will be moving to uh, to exact uh, config files. Uh, I will start with the configuration uh, from a BGP pair of routers, those external routers that connect us to upstream ESPs on the uh, hub location. Uh, I usually start with the uh, controls because I forgot them so many times, like I typed uh, really complicated uh, 
<laughs> a setup uh, and in the end uh, something won't work because I forgot uh, two simple sys, uh, sys controls. So here it goes. Uh, it's the same on uh, on both routers. Uh, we just need to enable IP forwarding uh, in order to turn these uh, OpenBSD boxes into routers. And uh, because uh, we will be using CARP, uh, Common Address Redundancy Protocol on these routers, we need to also enable CARP preempt. As you see, uh, it's the same on bo both routers. Uh, we will be now configuring uh, physical interfaces. I tried to color code somehow these text to be more uh, readable. And I also highlighted the changes. Uh, in uh, my particular case, those uh, two firewalls are actually uh, HP ProLiance uh, 360s, which come with uh, uh, BGE interfaces. So on uh, BGE0, interface on both routers, uh, we use it for uh, for PFSync, a physical interface. And uh, it's uh, usually, uh, those routers are usually connected with cross cable in order to, uh, to achieve maximum availability of this interface. Uh, we put this on uh, some uh, slash 30, private space. So you see the difference is only in uh, uh, last octet of, uh, of IP address. Uh, then we have a BGE1 interface, which is uh, the interface which uh, connects uh, to DMZ. And uh, I used here RFC IP address uh, used for documentation and examples, but this is uh, in real uh, in real life, actually, uh, public IP that belongs to our own uh, uh, public IPv4 address space that is tied to our autonomous system. Uh, I like to choose uh, 252 and 253, which is uh, not the last address, but the ones close to last one because uh, I see this as, okay, traffic is leaving our network uh, through these addresses, so they are the, the last uh, last point before data leaves. Uh, you will see later that uh, dot 24 uh, will actually be uh, the shared address of uh, CARP interface. We give it a description so we uh, we know better what's uh, going on. As for BG2, uh, this is a interface that connects us to ESP1, and uh, we are basically getting these uh, IP addresses from uh, from our ESP. They are they can be any public IPs as long as they are slash twenty nine. Uh, as I said, uh, we need uh, three addresses uh, for this uh, setup for us, which is, uh, uh, as you see, dot four for physical interface of uh, first uh, CARP member, dot five for uh, physical interface of uh, second uh, BGP router, and then there will be uh, dot six for uh, for shared CARP interface, and similar. Uh, Interface BGE3 connects us to uh, to second DSP. We also here have dot four and dot five, and we will have uh, dot uh, six for shared CARP interface. And you will notice that we also assign those interfaces to group internet. And this will be. Uh, Thanks to this group, we will be uh, making our PF rule set uh, more readable because we will be able to just block something on internet or pass something on internet or match something on internet. We won't need to write two separate rule sets for 
uh, for uh, two different ESPs. Okay, as for CARP interfaces, uh, I uh, put them uh, with uh, dotted uh, lines, so they are a bit different from physical. Uh, and I also uh, highlighted uh, with, uh, with gray highlighter difference between uh, BGP1 and BGP2, and you see that they are almost identical except for the value of ADVSQ, which dictates which of the two CARP members is going to be designated master and which will be backup. The one with higher ADVSQ will uh, be uh, backup. Also, uh, you see the difference uh, that uh, we have uh, VHID1. They need to match between uh, CARP interface pairs and they should be different between different CARP pairs, especially if they are on the same network. So we make a CARP uh, interface for DMZ with shared IP address, uh, the same uh, for uh, a group of interfaces uh, connecting us to ESP1 and to ESP2. And uh, additionally, we have a logical PF sync interface, which is tied to, uh, to physical interface uh, BG0, the one that we connected those two boxes with the uh, crossover cable. And over this uh, interface, we will be synchronizing uh, PF uh, state tables, which will uh, enable uh, seamless failover and preservation of all uh, states in PF. Okay, as for BGP, it's uh, controlled by BGPDConf. Uh, we see first that we have uh, three macros in the early in the rule set, uh, like our autonom autonomous system number, uh, IP addresses of our two ESPs, and then we announce our ASN. Uh, we set a different router ID for each uh, uh, BGP CARP member. We define uh, our prefix set my networks. This is imaginary IP address. It would be actually some public uh, IP uh, slash 24. We create a group upstreams where one neighbor is uh, ESP1, which we defined uh, earlier, their remote autonomous system description and that we communicate to them from our local address, which is physical address of interface connected to them. The same for, for second neighbor. And at the end of this uh, rule set comes the, the most important part where we instruct our ESPs for them to set next hop to our network through CARP interface and not physical interface. This way, when they are actually not sending uh, traffic to any of the of the car, uh, BGP CARP uh, members, their physical interface, they are sending it to CARP. So primary goes down, the second one just goes down. Uh, one would maybe wonder why are we not uh, doing this uh, directly from CARP interface or why is BGP does not have some mechanism to depend on CARP interface? Well, the reality is uh, it doesn't. Uh, it's uh, BGP protocol is uh, like that. You need to have... Uh, uh, have it uh, always running and have uh, the the knowledge of, of complete topology. So this is how it's done, or maybe it could be done other way, but this is how I done it and how it works for me. Uh, pay attention that most of these config files are not complete rule sets. They will, of course, not work just by uh, uh, copy-pasting them. 
and uh, sometimes uh, there are some values to be changed, but sometimes they also contain uh, pseudo uh, code or simplified uh, stuff. But uh, I'm sure they will be uh, just fine uh, to to demonstrate the the concept. Okay, let's go back for a second. Uh, that's all. <laughs> Believe it or not, for a BGP pair of routers, uh, we configured just a few config files, and uh, that's it. Uh, you should try testing with uh, with uh, some TCP transfers from DMZ to the internet, and from internet to DMZ and uh, start uh, pulling out cables from uh, some of the boxes, reboot one CARP member, reboot other CARP member, pull out cable from ESP1, uh, then put it back, then ESP2. It should, it should all work, and uh, neither of the TCP sessions should break. Make sure to test it before you put it into production. But yes, it's that easy. It's just a few config files. We will be now moving to our pair of NAT routers. Those are the inner ones, uh, the ones uh, that will act as a, as a center of the star topology that, that spokes connect uh, to over, over GRE tunnels, our hub routers. So we also start with the uh, syscontrol, Sys controls. Uh, this uh, this sys control conf uh, is uh, uh, have a few more lines besides uh, enabling IP forwarding and car preempt. We need also to enable multipath because uh, uh, this uh, router will have uh, multiple paths to each of the spokes. And because GRE tunnels will be terminating uh, on uh, on them, we need to uh, also allow uh, GRE. Uh, so uh, the CCTL conf is uh, identical on both uh, NAT routers. Okay, uh, we are now configuring physical interfaces. Uh, we also start with PF sync interface, which is uh, just a local uh, to these two routers IP address space, but we don't want to make any conflict anyway. So we put it on some other slash 30. Uh, then uh, we create uh, physical interfaces that uh, connect to DMZ. And we see that we put them on uh, dot two and dot three. Uh, dot one will be actually shared CARP interface. Uh, and also we have a, a LAN interface for our headquarters. It's on uh, private I IP address space. And uh, I put it on uh, slash 29, uh, not because uh, my HQ LAN is uh, so uh, little, it's because uh, on the other side of this link is actually uh, L3 switch. Uh, so this is just transit network uh, to hold 1060 uh, 00 slash 21 network. So as you see, uh, I highlighted the uh, differences uh, between uh, those two uh, routers. Uh, there's only difference in uh, last octet of uh, IP address. It's a good idea to, to keep these, uh, these config files uh, as similar as possible because later on uh, you can uh, easily template them. All right, uh, now we go to CARP interfaces. Uh, as I described earlier, they are identical except for higher value of ADV skew on, uh, on uh, designated uh, CARP uh, backup. Uh, and uh, uh, VHID value should be different from uh, any other on this site. So we put them on four and five. 
And here you will also see that I added some aliases onto uh, CARP uh, DMZ interface. And uh, that's because uh, uh, we will be redirecting some traffic uh, to the to HQ LAN, and it's easier if we don't need to put it on some high custom ports, but to have one-on-one -on -one mapping of IP address to, to inner host. In the end, uh, we have a whole slash 24 of public IP addresses, so it's not a problem to allocate allocate four or 10 or 20 of them for internal redirections. As for PF sync, we just uh, instructed that uh, that uh, it will work over a physical interface BG0. Uh, okay, ISAC MPD conf. Uh, I'm setting this uh, to uh, to IP because this AKMPD tends to bind to all the uh, available IPs on the host. And because these NAT routers will have uh, hundreds of uh, IP addresses on it, uh, thanks to so many GRE tunnels and uh, CARP interfaces and whatever. So I like to instruct this AKMPD Listen only on DMZ physical interface on both uh, CARP members of uh, not CARP cluster. Uh, next thing is uh, IPSecConf. You will uh, notice that I haven't put stuff directly in IPSecConf. I just included some uh, files in uh, ipsecconf.d, which I uh, created myself, and then I put uh, the actual ipsecconf files into this directory. Uh, the reason is not only uh, better readability of these files, uh, the reason is also uh, if you want to flush some ipsec rules, you usually do that by of course, I, IPsec CTL uh, big F, which flushes everything, but you also have the ability to, to flush uh, rules uh, contained in some config files uh, with, uh, with D switch uh, and uh, to point it to some uh, config file. So this way I can just flush or load rules from uh, some spoke and not all of them together. This is template for IPSecCon for uh, some spoke. So I'm doing the, the transport uh, transport mode. So from uh, not one uh, DMZ address to some spoke ESP1. I put some uh, authentication and cypers, maybe they are not the best one. They work for me. If you have any advices, uh, I would like to hear it. And we see that we have uh, one, uh, uh, one rule set to, uh, to ESP1 on some spoke and then the, the, the same one to, to ESP2 on same spoke. And then we need also to do that on uh, NAT2 a firewall, but we here do it from physical interface of NAT2 DMZ to ESP1 and ESP2. So I will show it how it looks for uh, spoke one. And then we will have it the same for spoke two. And as I said, I have uh, uh, at this moment around 30 spokes, but they are all done with the same logic. And that's it. Uh, actually, NAT uh, is uh, almost done. At this point, uh, we still don't have our spokes connected to, uh, to NAT routers and our uh, inter-location uh, 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 Traffic is not working, but at this point uh, uh, we have working a uh, highly available NAT pair as uh, from point of view of uh, routing for a local LAN. 
which means that uh, we can uh, test, uh, reboot one of uh, two CARP members to see if, uh, if our internet traffic from uh, HQ LAN uh, will survive, and it should. Okay, now we will start to configure spoke routers. Uh, I'm starting also with sys controls. We need uh, IP forwarding, IP multipath, and uh, to allow GRE. Uh, someone asked here about uh, WCCP. I really am not sure. I enable it. <laughs> Maybe it can be disabled. Uh, this works for me. I will uh, give it a bit more of a of a read. I I think I saw that in man page, so I I put it there. Okay. So as for LAN interfaces, uh, we have uh, of course some private address space. You see that this is uh, slash twenty nine. As I said, on all the on all the spoke uh, locations, uh, I have a layer three switch. So this is only transit uh, slash twenty nine network for bigger slash twenty four network with a bunch of VLANs. As you see, this is a template. And uh, it only differs in uh, third uh, octet. It is uh, very important to plan IP addressing scheme of uh, of such uh, big networks. Otherwise, uh, your uh, config files can be a real mess. It's good to have them uh, uniform so that you always know. Ah, sixty four. I know that. Uh, I don't know. Hungary or the dot 65 in ter third octet, uh, yes, okay, that's uh, Novi Sad here in Belgrade and so on. Okay, this is an uh, interesting part. Unfortunately, my line breaks got garbled here in conversion, but I hope uh, it will be clear. Okay, so these are the interfaces on our spokes that are connected to our uh, uh, primary ESP. You will notice that uh, they are put uh, in our domain one. The reason for this is uh, that uh, you can have uh, uh, GRE tunnels uh, which terminate uh, on same uh, peer and uh, it would work, but when you mix it with IPsec, it doesn't work. So we need to put each of the ESPs into separate uh, routing domain. We got this IP address from our ESP. It's standard uh, slash 30 point to point link. We gave it a meaningful description. And uh, also we are uh, assigning a default route over next hop interface. And you see that we have slash T1, which means we are putting it into uh, routing domain one. We also need to uh, start ISAKMPD daemon in routing domain one in order for this to work. And... Uh, for this uh, reason, we created uh, uh, we created a special file isakmpd.conf.1, and we will also have isakmpd.conf.2, uh, each for uh, each uh, routing domain. There will be no isakmpd.conf without dot number on on spoke routers. Uh, so we also need to load some IPsec control rules in particular routing uh, domain one and load them from IPsecconf one. And let's not forget that if we want to be able to SSH to this uh, interface from the internet, we also need to have uh, SSH uh, D started in... Uh, also routing domain one, for which we created a separate uh, config file. Uh, 
So you see that uh, this is actually a template. Uh, the only thing that differs on all spokes are the IP addresses, net masks, and uh, default gateways we obtained from our ESP. Everything else is the same. Uh, I guess I need to speed this up a bit. Uh, we come to ESP2 interfaces, which is uh, almost the same, except for the fact that everything here is done is routing domain two and not routing domain one. So we have uh, uh, isakmp conf.2, we have ipsec conf.2, and we have sshd config.2. We must not forget to create uh, ANC interfaces uh, in their uh, respective routing domains. Otherwise, nothing would uh, be encrypted and we wouldn't be able to encrypt our tunnels or SSH to these interfaces. As for isakmpd.conf, Dot one and dot two, we just uh, instruct uh, isakmpd to listen on their respective inter uh, uh, respective uh, IP addresses. And uh, as for ipsecconf, uh, unfortunately, also line break here is a little garbled, so they are self-explanatory for anyone that uh, that has ever configured uh, ipsec. Uh, the same for IPsec uh, conf2. Okay, we also do three different SSHD config file. Uh, the, the default SSHD config file, which uh, gets started uh, from RC, we put a LAN address, and then for routing domain one, we put ESP1 address, and for routing domain two, we put ESP to address. And here comes uh, the final few slides, uh, which are almost uh, most important for, th for this. Uh, these are uh, GRE tunnels themselves. Uh, they should also be self-explanatory. As we said, uh, there will be uh, four per each spoke so it's uh, my private address, his private IP address, uh, my uh, public address, his IP address. And we repeat it for a number of, uh, of spokes. You will notice here, and this is very, very important, that uh, you should not, or I haven't, uh, uh, named my GRE interfaces like GRE 1, 2, 3, 4, because once you have them uh, 30 times 4, which is uh, 120, it really becomes uh, unmanageable. Instead, what I do is uh, that all the GRE interfaces, which uh, end on first ESP of, of spoke start with one, as you see with all of these uh, all of these interfaces. And if they terminate on not one, they end with one. And if they terminate on not two, they end with two. So actually the middle two digits are significant, like zero one tunnel, which goes from not one to ESP one. And on a ESP on a NAT2, it's uh, actually 0, 01 uh, GRE tunnel, tunnel that uh, goes over ESP1 but terminates on, on a NAT2 CARP member. It's really a lot easier if you, if you number your GRE tunnels like this. So as you see, uh, these are the ones that uh, go over spoke CSP2, and you will notice they all start with 2. It's not actually 2011 GRE interface. That's, fir uh, uh, that's first GRE tunnel that goes over spoke CSP2. 
On spoke routers, of course, we just reverse things. We call it the same GRE interface and we now said, okay, my private IP address, his private IP address and tunnel from my public IP address to his IP address. And this is very interesting. We need to put those tunnels into tunnel domain one. Otherwise they wouldn't work because we put this physical interface in our domain one, remember. Okay, so over ISP2, it's the same, it's just that uh, you uh, need to put it into tunnel domain 2. Okay, I'm finishing. I have just a few more slides. As for OSPFD.conf, uh, we are putting different metric and... Uh, Anyone who uh, takes a closer look to these slides will notice. I won't describe anymore because we are running short of time. So SPFD conf on, on other spokes. Finally, RC conf local. We see that on BGP1, we just need to start BGPD. On uh, Hubnut routers, we start IPsec, ISAC, MPD, and OSPFD. And on spokes, we just start OSPFD from RCConf local because remember, we started all the other demons uh, that we need like ISAC MPD and IPsec uh, from, uh, from hostname if files by means of scripts. Finally, we need to exchange uh, keys, uh, put them into, uh, you see where. Uh, and the NAT1 and NAT2 will need two pub keys for each spoke CSP. Spokes will have two of the same pub keys in total, one for NAT1 and one for NAT2. Or perhaps you can use pre-shared keys in IPsec.conf, but perhaps better not. PF, we don't have time to talk about PF. We don't have time to talk about uh, setup without PF, but I will give just a few general guidelines. PF comps should be identical on both card members. You should increase state limits. Use interface groups and interface macros. Use interface modifiers like colon network, colon peer, colon zero. Do not sync unneeded state, so traffic terminating on me are no sync and traffic passing through me sync, block everything, pass what's needed. As for spoke routers, PF rule sets should be identical for all spokes. I mean rule sets, of course not macros. Uh, you say macro names and change their values per spoke. Block everything, pass what's needed. Permit inbound SSH from anywhere to both ESP interfaces for troubleshooting purposes if tunnels are down for some reason. Only UDP 500, which is ISAC MP and Proto ESP2 and from HQ need to be passed on both ESP interfaces. Quite a lot of rules need to be if bound and keep spokes rule set minimal. Do all the filtering on hub. And that's all folks. Thank you for listening. If you have any further questions regarding this setup or even want me to type it for you, need advice on network architecture, need help with running services in FreeBSD jails like DNS, database, email, web, whatever, or just want to hang around, talk about music, retro gaming or whatever, you can contact me on the following contacts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marco. So you have a couple of questions in the share notes. There okay. are a lot of them. Let's try to answer a couple of them in, in the next uh, three or four minutes until this, uh, this recording will stop. So please go to the share notes and try to pass through the questions. Okay. And the remaining one you will be taking in the um, Holloway Talks. Okay. Maybe in the lunch. Okay, so uh, what made me pick the double star topology? Actually, when I uh, first came as a young uh, sysadmin, net admin to uh, to company I work for now, there were uh, just uh, three one links, and they were over frame relay with, uh, I don't know, some uh, rip routing or whatever, and they were running on some Cisco 800 routers. So uh, actually this uh, network uh, is evolving for last 13 years and I'm the one who is uh, testing, trying out things. I uh, 
this is of course not the first iteration. I was uh, tunneling IPsec in tunnel mode. Uh, I was uh, trying a lot of different things and I came to, to this solution at the moment. Who knows what will be in uh, in few years, but uh, for now I picked uh, this because uh, it gives me what I need, <laughs> which is peace of mind. I like uh, uh, sleep well. No one calls me that, uh, that things don't work. Perfect. Go ahead at the next questions. Okay. Are the GRE tunnels over the one on your OSPF backbone area? Yes, everything is backbone area uh, uh, zero. You will see that in, uh, in OSPF uh, config files. So go ahead and answer all the questions uh, without okay. interrupting you. So. Okay, why did I decide on CARP instead of dynamic routing on the hubs? I don't really understand that question. Perhaps we can uh, discuss it in the hallway. Uh, does failover go back to the primary ISP? Yes, it does after some times and uh, it's all seamless. It, it really works really good. Do I track availability via RIPE and how many nines do I typically get? No, I haven't yet uh, tracked uh, availability via RIPE. Uh, I'm actually uh, tracking uh, availability of all my, uh, all my sites from central location via uh, Nagios, just by pinging them each 10 minutes and then I do uh, then I do monthly report and uh, it all looks really good. But I would be interesting, interested about uh, uh, getting to know how can I track uh, availability via RIPE. Uh, do I delay forwarding new states until PFSync has synced? Uh, well, uh, I... You saw in my config files what I do. I don't really know, but uh, CARP and uh, all the components of this setup are really smart. Like nothing will kick in before it's ready to kick in. I never got the, the situation where our CARP master uh, took over the master role and then something was late and not yet ready to do. It seems that that whole system is really nicely designed so that only when everything will work, uh, master will take over the role. Do I run if stated? Before I moved to this setup, I was experimenting a lot with if stated, but uh, in the end, I noticed I won't be able to accomplish what I need with uh, if stated. So no, in this setup, I don't need it. So, Marco, we should stop here. Uh, sorry, okay. we have three or four more questions, but soon the meeting will, will end, and I want to close here. Uh, all the other questions, uh, please put uh, Marco in the hallway talks or send him a private chat with them. Okay, you have, my contacts and I, yep. you have my contacts, and I will be in the hallway, so we can continue discussing stuff there. Okay, thank you very much, Marco. You have a very interesting presentation and you had a lot of audience and a lot of questions. So this means it was a very interesting information here. So congrats, thank you very much and uh, enjoy the conference. Thank you for listening.